Good evening and welcome to Northern Kentucky History Hour. We're just going to spend about a minute letting everyone in and then we will get started. Thank you so much for joining us. And Tara Johnson, knowing. Uh, okay. Again, welcome to those of you just joining us for Northern Kentucky History Hour. Um, my name is Tara Johnson Nome, and we will be getting started in just one moment with tonight's guest. Wonderful. Well, good evening and welcome to Northern Kentucky History Hour. Again, my name is Tara Johnson Nome. I'm a member of Behringer Crawford Museum's Board of Trustees. I see many other trustees in the audience tonight. So thank you to all of you as board members for your support. Thanks to the museum for hosting and uh, providing uh, programming support for Northern Kentucky History Hour. This is our 20th episode. So we started to provide some additional programming for all of us. Uh, while we were not getting out so much these last several months, and it's really turned into to quite something. If you've missed any of our previous episodes, you are welcome to check those out. They're on Facebook, on Behringer Crawford Museum's Facebook page, and they have also, most of them, I believe, uh, also been saved to YouTube, to our YouTube channel. So I uh, would love for you to check out our in, uh, interviews with authors, uh, a lo local archaeologists and historians. Um, for tonight, before we get started, um, I always like to start off with a little bit of some housekeeping. So we, um, we will ask everyone to keep their interview, their microphone muted uh, during the um, presentation, but we want you to still participate. So if you would, please enter any kind of question or um, information that you, you know, want to ask in the chat box. And then we will be able to um, curate those and I'll make sure to uh, ask your question. So keep those questions coming. Um, I believe that we have a quiz tonight. I'm pretty sure we talked about that maybe. So if we do, then um, you uh, can answer the question in the quiz in the chat box as well. And if you win the quiz, you will be uh, the proud recipient of both bragging rights and one of our NKY History Hour uh, hat pins. So uh, good luck to all of you who, um, you know, it, it's gotten to be quite the competition. So um, I also, of course, could not start without thanking the supporters of Behringer Crawford Museum. Uh, we are supported by the city of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, the Kentucky Arts Council, the Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, and the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation. Thank you all so much uh, to all those organizations for your support, and thank you to our members. Uh, many of you I know on the call tonight are already members, but if you're not quite a member yet, but you've been thinking about it, you can go to bcmuseum.org and find out more. Okay, well, thanks again for joining us. I am so proud uh, to have with us tonight, Kathy Merchant. She uh, stepped down in 2015 as president and CEO of the Greater Cincinnati Foundation after 18 years of service and leadership to the community. But she has been very busy since then. Uh, she came to Cincinnati from New Haven, Connecticut where she had lived for nearly two decades after graduating with a master's of social work from University of Connecticut. But since 2015, Kathy has remained connected to community philanthropy as a writer and consultant and has pursued hyper-educated passion for wine as a writer, educator, and travel guide. She was just telling me about some of her trips that happened before all of us were grounded a bit. So um, Kathy's occasional wine blog, Vino Ventures, is available at www.kathymerchant.wine. So I'll have to check that out. Um, but tonight she's with us because she has edited a book, Imagineers, Impresarios, Inventors, Cincinnati's Arts and the Power of Her. So she's going to tell us about this incredible work celebrating women in the arts in our region. 
Uh, let's see, Kathy, I'm going to ask you to unmute and welcome. I am unmuted. I bet with that introduction, everybody was secretly wishing that I was going to talk about like a trip to Italy and some <laughs> or something, right? <laughs> I yeah. can do that, do that, but that is not the agenda. <laughs> so thank you very much for inviting me to do this. Um, this book that I'm going to talk with you about tonight was a definite labor of love. And uh, the story of origin starts two years ago, actually in Connecticut, when I was visiting a friend and happened upon this very interesting book called Artist Next Door. And it was edited by a dear friend of mine who has since passed away. But when I'm flipping through it and looking at the people in New Haven that that community thought was you know, very cool for their contributions to the arts, both men and women, I thought, you know what, New Haven, you've got nothing on Cincinnati. I think we can do better than this. So I came home from that trip in August of 2018, and I wrote up a prospectus for a book. I mean, not even really, to be honest, knowing what I was doing. And I handpicked Artswave as the sponsor for the book because I always had it in my mind that there should be a charitable purpose to this. My friend Cheever had done that with his book and I wanted to do the same. And I thought that Artswave would be the perfect sponsor. So it took me a little bit to get on their calendar. They're busy people, but uh, on my visit to CEO Alicia Kintner, I presented the book prospectus. And after about two minutes, she basically told me to be quiet and said, if you'll do the book just about women, I'm in. And I thought, okay, I, that sounds really exciting. Sure, I'd love to do that. And the reason for that was that, um, Unbeknownst to me, they had they Artswave had already been planning uh, in the early stage an initiative that came to be called the Power of Her, which was really borrowing the spotlight of the centennial celebration of women's suffrage and the passage of the 19th Amendment, but to shine a light as well on other leadership that was inspired and inspiring during that time. So with that notion in mind, I just want to explain a little bit of the process because there are some fairly important and maybe unique aspects about that. Um, first, we uh, commissioned sort of a public nomination process because we thought, yeah, you know, we know a lot of people, but we don't know everybody. So when the results of that came in, and uh, and by the way, just as an anecdote, we had thought, well, we'll just do 100 women. That'll be nice with the 100th anniversary of um, women's suffrage. We'll pick 100 women. Well, with like basically no effort, our community named well more than 200 women. And we thought, uh, this is a technical term. Oh, crap. Now what do we do? <laughs> so... In reviewing the list, we went, okay, it's a really robust list, but we feel like some things are missing. And what we're missing were some of the older legacy uh, people that maybe folks don't know about or don't remember as uh, fresh in their minds as they do current artists. And then the newer, younger generation that has really come alive in the 21st century in a variety of art forms, um, they were kind of overlooked. And then the list was not terribly diverse in an ethnic and racial sense. So we added, um, we asked, I should say, the Cincinnati Art Museum and the Cincinnati Museum Center, and I would like to thank them for their extra research effort to, in, um, to identify who those women would be. Well, then we were way, way over 200 people. So then we had to like come up with some very discerning criteria to whittle that list down, knowing that it was gonna be not fun and complicated to do that. And once we had finally narrowed that down, we still almost had 200 people. So Alicia says to me, Kathy, we just, you know, this just has to be like organic, just figure it out. I'm like, okay, well, what do you mean by that? She didn't know, I didn't either. But eventually what came out of that was the following. Um, we realized that from a period of nine, uh, I'm sorry, 1854 until 2017, that in our region, 35 arts organizations had been birthed and that they were all still in business. So that was the biggest aha from the entire process that if you, know, if you don't look at it in a certain way, you just don't realize what a 
treasure you have. We know we have a treasure. We think we're amazing in this region. We are amazing in this region, but that little uh, data point was pretty spectacular. Um, by the time we got that all figured out and decided how we would fit all of that information into a book without making it so big you couldn't lift it, we narrowed the um, official women who were profiled to 120. So there are 120 stories in the book. And then we were able to add to that the names of women, mostly in history, who were collaborators to get organizations started. So let me just give you one example. Um, the Art Academy of Cincinnati is really one of the very first arts organizations that got started in 1854, a group of women, um, the leader of whom was in her 50s at the time, which I think is very cool, uh, had, had moved here with her uh, second husband from Philadelphia, where she had also tried to start an art school and was teaching art classes. So it took about another uh, 12 years or so before, I think it was 59, 59 or 69, do the math. They just had their 150th anniversary last year. But it took that group of women just sort of plowing ahead, forging ahead to get the organization to the point where it could be funded, they could have a building, they could start hiring teachers. And so that's like, there are amazing stories like that. So we found the names of the women who were part of that initial collaboration. And we put those in the book as well. When all is said and done, we got to write at 200 women. And, I, and in case I forget to say this later, I really have to say that is just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more women that we could have included. All we would have had to do is like change one criteria and we could have opened up a whole other pathway and everybody is like, oh, well, there's another book in there, isn't there? I'm like, yeah, probably, but not, not right away. But the one other thing that we did that I super, super love about this process and it was of necessity was that we invited local writers, journalists, and uh, published authors to write these profiles of the women in the book. So in the end, if you include me, there were 34 of us who wrote those 120 profiles. And so each of them has their own tone, their own voice. I edited the whole thing, but I tried to stick with the writer's own voice. And that's another art form that we don't always recognize is that journalistic and writing, um, writing talent. So that took us all of 2019 to get those decisions made, to get the profiles written, to get the book designed, to get it printed. And then COVID hit, so we couldn't get our books here in Cincinnati. They were sitting on a loading dock in China for quite some time, uh, but they finally arrived in July. And here is the beautiful book. The publisher is Orange Fraser, if you know it, Orange Fraser Press. It is a woman owned publishing house in Wilmington, Ohio. And I loved working with them. They are so fantastic. If you pick up any book by an artist in this community, chances are way better than 80% that this was the publisher. Their design skills are just extraordinary. So um, now that I've laid the ground of kind of how we got to this point, I want to talk a little bit about some of the big messages. And then I want to dive into the stories, the wonderful stories about five women from Northern Kentucky. And along the way, I want to identify their links to the Behringer Crawford Museum because they exist. Everything is linked ultimately. So there are really um, five big messages about all the women in the book. Pick an age, pick an era, pick a, an art form. You'll find these five nuggets. I've already mentioned one of them, and that is collaboration. They say, the big they in the sky, say that women are actually better collaborators than men. I don't know that I believe that's true, but there is evidence of a lot of it in our art forms. None of these organizations <clears throat> would have come to pass if it weren't for the collaboration of, among the women who had a mission and a vision that they shared and were willing to work hard over a long period of time to make things happen. All of the organizations had a leader 
but they also had many leaders. So there were a few women who were, I mean, you can find their fingerprints on almost everything that is part of our regional asset base, whether it's um, the opera, which celebrated its 100th anniversary this year, or the Taft Museum, or, um, oh my God, I'm having a brain fart. Um, our music celebration that with the May Festival. I'm sorry, that was not going to come. Uh, so there are a few women who just like Mary Emery from Marymount and, uh, you know, both of the Tafts, Anna Sinton Taft and her sister-in-law um, as well. I mean, they were working on everything together. And of course, they had some money in their own families and they had access to power and to privilege and to money from their husbands and their families. But uh, boy, did they put it to good use. They were innovators. Often what they were doing was being done for the first time. And I want to tell you something, one funny story that I really had to dig for this, and I hope it's really true. But you know how everybody always says, well, you know, New York, we, we're just as good as New York. You know, we have, we have cool stuff just like New York does. And, you know, some people say, mm, you might think you're the queen city, but I'm not sure that you are. Well, we did a bunch of things before the people in New York did. So do you know that there is something called the um, Women Art Center? It's been around for at this point, 132 years. And our Women's Art Center which now operates as the barn, which is sort of out Marymount way, um, was founded before the one in New York. And they claim even on their website that they were first. I went over and over and over the startup data points. Nope, guess what? We were first. And our art academy even was just a skosh behind a similar one in uh, New York and another in Philadelphia because that eventually got started as well. So we really, we're cutting edge and we still are. I, I like to describe um, as I'm on to the next quality of entrepreneurship, that there's a flywheel effect in the arts in this region. So once you get things going, then it goes faster and it goes faster and it builds on itself. So of the 35 organizations that were founded from 1854 until 2017, nine of them were founded in the 21st century. And there were only 17 years that had passed in the 20th century and they didn't even get going until like 2006. So it was just going faster and faster and there was more and more support and more and more demand for a diverse array of different types of art forms and people believing that they could do it. And you probably would have already guessed by now, as I'm talking about those 35 organizations still being in business, that sustainability is another one of those ingredients that's really important. We have proven over many years that our arts organizations are very, very sustainable. Um, you may or may not have heard that instead of 35, we now have 34, but it didn't go out of business. It was kind of like a family succession plan, even though the two people are not related. Um, so Jefferson James, who founded the Contemporary Dance Theater a really long time ago, like she was still a dancer in the late 60s, early 70s, and later became a presenting company instead of a performing company. And then one of the 21st century artists is Jean Mam Luft, hyphenated last name. And the two of them kind of got together as Jeff was wanting to maybe hang up her administrative leadership chops, and Jean is climbing up that ramp and they decided that they would create a new company that integrates the best of both worlds and their roles have changed and I, I just think it's a beautiful family-like succession story proving that we know how to sustain our arts <clears throat> excuse me in Cincinnati sorry shouldn't try to like talk and swallow at the same time I um, I don't know if anybody's monitoring chat. I can't see chat, but if anybody has any questions about the process or the big points that I've just made, I'd be happy to answer them because next I'm gonna to move to the five women. Yes, yeah. I am monitoring the chat. So if anyone has a question, go ahead and add it and um, I can let you know, Kathy, okay. if, if one comes up. Good enough. So I'm gonna start with Rosemary Clooney. I'm guessing there's nobody on this Zoom call who doesn't know who Rosemary Clooney is, but I, um, I don't know, she was, 
She was an interesting woman. It's amazing that she actually made it um, because her upbringing and her early years were really troubled. I mean, her family was a mess and she married not well and there was alcoholism and drugs and there was just like lots of problems. But she and her sister kind of bailed on the family to go make their way here in Cincinnati when they were 13 and 16. Uh, Rosemary was 16 at the time. And they started to sing for radio station WLW and they made 20 bucks a week. I mean, that is brave, like to bolt from, from Maysville, Kentucky, come live essentially by themselves in Cincinnati and get a job. It was probably illegal, but uh, you know, they, they did it. And they met a guy, a national band leader named Tony Pastor. And when uh, her younger sister grew tired of, of that, um, Rosemary moved to New York and entered into a solo career with Columbia Records. And she became part of what was known as the girl singer movement, along with Doris Day, who was also in the book, uh, Peggy Lee and Patti Page. So her first hit in 1950 was Beautiful Brown Eyes. And I love that song. I think it's gorgeous. So um, Mitch Miller discovered her in 1951 and she was on Ed Sullivan and, you know, she was still pretty young and then she got married and, you know, had kids and then her life was a mess. And I'm not going to go into all of that because I don't want Rosemary to be defined by that because she definitely clawed herself out of that situation. Um, so by 1975, uh, rock and roll had become the rage. And she was like, okay, I don't know how to do that. That's terrible. But in 75, Bing Crosby invited her to tour with him. And so that's like kind of a little, you know, crossover. My parents really loved Bing and all those guys. And, but for Rosemary, it was a true second act. So she recorded new songs and she performed the rest of her life. She fell in love again. She was married um, to uh, Dante DiPaolo until she passed away. And her son said that the last 20 years of her life were glorious. Her comeback solidified her place in jazz history as one of the great interpreters of American song. And for that, she won a Grammy Award for Lifetime Achievement in 2002. When we can go back to the theater, Playhouse in the Park will probably uh, repeat tenderly the Rosemary Clooney musical which is a wonderful show. I loved it. I was glad I got to see it. So that's our Rosemary. Now we have Jackie Demoline. Jackie's story was written by Kathy Y. Wilson. And if you don't know Kathy, who is also, by the way, in the book, she's an artist and a writer in her own right. Um, Kathy Wilson has got to be one of the coolest, cheekiest writers I've ever met. And so if you will... Uh, permit me, I'm going to read to you just a few of her own words instead of trying to add mine to hers. So just in case you don't know Jackie Demoline, she was a theater critic uh, for a long time at the Cincinnati Enquirer, and she passed away from cancer in uh, 2018. And these are Kathy's words. Whosoever comes after us, however they do so, will certainly wonder, does art even exist if no one is there to observe? note, deconstruct, criticize, or praise it. And of course she wrote that before COVID. Jackie's reporter's notepad was never fully visible, but always certainly there, perhaps expertly balanced on a knee, her pen poised and slightly elevated like the conductor's baton it was. When the lights went down, so did the tip of her pen, like the stylus on a thrilling new and difficult record album. Jackie is largely credited by producing directors with nurturing and furthering Cincinnati's nascent mid-1990s theater community. But even in the absence of her, her physical being, her name and what it meant to us is still wholly recognizable. I kind of wish Jackie were still alive so she could hear that written about her. It's probably cooler than her eulogy was. Um, so that's Jackie and that's Kathy Wilson, the writer. Now I'm going to shift to Arlene Snyder Gibbeau. And this is a story about um, the Covington Public Library, which 
is now known for short as the Carnegie. So you probably know that the building itself was built as a library in 1904. And it was on um, placed on the Register of Historic Places in 1971. But you know, people were kind of over that architectural preservation at that time. And it's very sad. Lots of them were lost, the um, public libraries that were built by Carnegie. But by the winter of 1974, the building in Covington needed extreme repair and renovation. And the city of Covington just did not have the money to bring that building back to life. And then you know what happens next. People pitch a proposal to tear the thing down. That's what always happens. Well, somebody needs to swoop in and a group of residents in Covington did just that. They formed the Northern Kentucky Arts Council. And by 1983, so about nine years later, they had uh, kept the vision alive for that whole time. So there you go, there's that sustainability and innovation and leadership. And they hired Arlene to work for next to nothing. And she mounted cutting edge shows on a shoestring. There's a couple of photos of her that I came across in the Kenton County Library, which by the way, if you ever need photos, your Kenton County Library is like the bomb. I love that place. I found so many great treasures there. Um, but anyway, um, so early in her, oh, so there were pictures of her like cutting costumes and you know putting up posters and doing all that kind of stuff. So um, in 1985, uh, the Fine Arts Fund, which is now called ArtsWave, launched the very first Northern Kentucky Fund Drive. So that's not all that long ago, which is kind of interesting. And uh, that really kind of got things going, adding to that a large bequest that helped excavate and revitalize the old theater, which had been dormant. Even though they got the rest of the building going, that beautiful theater was dark for all that time. So in honor of her leadership, Arlene received the 1992 Post Corbett Award. And I think the rest is history. The Carnegie seems to be doing pretty well. I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Love the Carnegie. It's a beautiful facility and they do, they mount wonderful shows and have great productions there. The next person I wanna talk about is Angela Williamson. She is the founding arts administrator for the Kentucky Symphony Orchestra, a position that she's held for 24 years. So she actually had um, a degree, two of them, one in music and one in accounting. And um, she went on to get a master's degree here in Cincinnati, even though she was from Florida. But the Kentucky Symphony uh, needed someone to take on an administrative leader. They, I don't remember the exact year that the orchestra itself was founded. I don't think I have that in here, um, but they changed names a couple of times. And um, so Angela was hired and said this about her role in the organization. Consistency in leadership is vital, especially in smaller organizations and arts organizations greatest assets are its people. Well, one of those people was her now husband. So J.R. Cassidy was the founder and the music director for the Kentucky Symphony, and they've been married all of that time. So she mentions a couple of people as she was being interviewed for her profile, one of whom is Lori Risch. She wanted to credit Lori as well as several other people who had really helped her in her career and in her leadership venture. And then finally, I wanna mention Margareta Baker Hunt. I actually wrote this one because I was just intrigued to figure out who, who is she? I mean, I'd heard about the museum for a long time. And if I do say my, so myself, I really like my opening line because I am a philanthropist uh, or a leader of one at heart. Margareta Baker Hunt could give lessons on how to turn grief into generosity. So in a period of about six years, and this was a long time ago, so 1888 to 1894, Baker Hunt first lost her only child to spinal meningitis. And then in quick succession, her mother, her husband, and her father passed away. And she could have just drowned in that grief, but she didn't. 
Um, Covington was her adopted community. There's a very cool history that again, um, goes back to Philadelphia, which is kind of fun that Cincinnati has all these ties to Philadelphia, which I learned about. And um, her father discovered Cincinnati when he and a business partner, a future business partner, were looking for a lively city to launch a lamp and candle shop, which they did here. Uh, so Margaret Baker married Dr. William Hunt, who was from Covington. And um, there are some scudders involved. So scudder is like a whole other, you know, family tree that we could spend some time time on. But uh, Margareta's niece, Kate Scudder, who was a bit of a globetrotter, um, lived with her, and the two women became super involved in community activities. They would they would host anything. They would host the Covington Art Club, the Covington Culture Club, the Linden Grove Cemetery Memorial Association. They came be kind of the hub of Co Covington. So by about 1922, when she was quite old, um, Baker Hunt decided because she had no direct heirs other than this niece that she would formalize, excuse me, her community work and she created the Baker Hunt Foundation. Now that was actually early to do something like that. The period 1914 to 20-ish, 25, was a period when lots of organizations were started, the Red Cross. I mean, there's just a ton of them. It was a huge foment of organizational leadership. So the mission though, was kind of a market basket of things. So its description is the promotion of art, education, science, psychic research, and good works of religion. Now that is a fabulous combination. I, I really don't know how you could put all that together, but she did. So um, today, the, it, the original museum has been transformed into a, a, an art and culture center and it's encompassed on three acres of property with four buildings and its collections have been moved to both the Beringer Crawford Museum and the Cincinnati Museum Center. So that sustainability of the original vision and the artifacts and everything um, has been kept for all time because those two are very du durable organizations as well. So I'm gonna close by saying one more time, the Behringer Crawford Museum itself was not founded by a woman. So that's one of the reasons why it wasn't in the book. And Lori absolutely could have been in the book. So I'm gonna say again, there is a whole other book about our community that could be written. There are so many fantastic women. And then somebody probably needs to write a book about the men because we don't wanna leave them out. None of this happened without them. It just so happened as this fluke of timing that the book is all about women. And I want to mention that the book is for sale by ArtsWave. All proceeds benefit ArtsWave. Um, and it, Christmas is coming, Hanukkah is coming. So you wanna make sure that you buy this book for everybody that you know. And so you can go online. The very best uh, place to purchase it is from ArtsWave itself because that maximizes the net profits that they can then uh, use for grant making. So it's www.artswave.org slash Imagineers, but you can also buy it um, at Joseph Beth or on Amazon. So that is my formal presentation. Oh my gosh, I'm two minutes short of when I wanted myself to shut up. That's good. <laughs> So I, <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. Um, well, we do have a couple questions and I have some questions myself. I always try to ask the audience questions first, but um, I'm glad I'm going to have time to ask my own as well tonight. Um, so one question that we had um, from Blanche Sullivan, who is one of our regular audience members, was um, actually about someone else um, besides the five women that you highlighted tonight, because as you mentioned, there's so many women in the book. Um, and she was wondering, was the woman who started the Art Academy, um, Sarah Worthington King Peter? Peter? Yes. Yeah. And she just yes. mentions that she has such a great story. She does. And she's in the book. So if you want to read about all those kind of ladies. So what we did in the middle of the book was organize the ladies' um, profiles by the organization. So Sarah Worthington King Peter um, 
There she is. Can you see that? Oh, great. Yes. And we, put, we included the bust of her, which is in the um, art museum, the Cincinnati Art Museum, because of course she had her hand in that as well. Um, so, and there are a few more people. So another one, for example, is Elizabeth Williams Perry, who was the ringleader to get the art museum started. And I can just turn page after page after page. Here's Margareta. I mean, I, I actually kind of like to read this book, even though I've read every dang word in this book a hundred times, I still like to read it. It's fun. That is wonderful. Well, you're reading it for fun this time. If I you am. <laughs> Work the first time, yeah. Um, so, okay, so we've had a couple of questions. Can you, and I saw that uh, Courtney has posted the link to the book. So if anyone oh, is wanting to purchase the book, um, you can um, click that link um, from the ArtsWave website. Um, but Kathy, why don't you tell everyone the exact full name of the book again, because we've had a couple people ask that. So it's three alliterative words. So they are imagineers, impresarios, inventors. Those are the first three words. And then uh, Cincinnati's arts and the power of her. Wonderful. So. Wonderful. You can see that. And I think that really speaks to the breadth of the arts that are really covered, you know, in the in the book as well, because you've talked about writers and uh, theater and visual artists. And so I feel like the title, you know, really speaks to that. It's wonderful. And one other thing, you can't tell this unless you get really close. I don't think you can see, but do you see, oh, that, yeah. there, do you see that there are all those women's faces? So there's this there's a silk screen of all the women in the book on the cover. When I first realized that, it's like, who would have thought of that? That's so amazing. I don't even know how they did it. So, and then the back has all these gorgeous arts. Oh, photos. that's wonderful. Oh, so, yeah. This is really rich with color and the innovation of the publisher. So everywhere you look in this book, there's something else to appreciate about the arts in our community. Yeah, those special touches really make it... Yeah. They make it so special. Um, okay, well, we have more questions and I'm hoping that my audio sounds okay because I'm getting a little feedback. Um, so Joe Daughtery was wondering, and I was actually wondering this too, that was gonna be one of my questions. So thank you, Joe, is I was actually taking notes on the qualities that you felt mm -hmm. were so critical from the people that were, um, you know, that were highlighted in the book in terms of collaboration and innovation. Um, yep. And he said he got entrepreneurship and he was looking for two more. I got sustainability. Yeah. So um, entrepreneurship, sustainability, innovation, leadership, and collaboration. Leadership. Those are the five. Yeah. Wonderful. So it's interesting. I'm, I'm actually doing one of these uh, talks for a financial services firm next week. And when I listed those off as we were kind of rehearsing, well, how might this conversation go? The president of the firm goes, oh my gosh, those are our values. I'm like, okay, well, it's a match. It's very good. <laughs> wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Uh, I mean, I think, cause I was gonna ask you before, before you started, you know, what do you find in terms of qualities that you're really seeing throughout all these women that allowed them to be successful. And so it's really cool that you went ahead and um, and and talk through that. I, hey, Kathy, I see somebody sent me a message, um, but it looks like it's really to you. So I'm gonna read it if that's okay. It says, Kathy, when I saw the topic in your native city, I wondered if you had participated in the New Haven book. If it's the same one, two of my friends are featured, Rosalind Kama, Oh no, I'm going to have this name incorrect. Uh, F-A-S-I-D and Carol Evans, award-winning producer of documentaries. Yeah. It was I, know, a I actually know Carol Evans. Yeah. Who's the note from? Luann Holmes. I don't know Luann Holmes, but Luann, thank you for bringing that up. No, I did not work on that book. So Cheever Tyler, who's a very good friend of mine, um, I actually just saw his wife on Friday and presented her with a book. I mentioned Cheever's name in the book because I totally got the idea from him, but he um, put that book together in 2005, at which point I had already moved here um, to Cincinnati and I didn't know about it until I just randomly, literally 
walked by the book on the tabletop at a friend's house and picked it up and went, well, Cheever, that's pretty cool. And then I kept going and went, oh no, it's not that cool. Cincinnati's cooler. We can do this. That's wonderful. That's yeah. wonderful. Um, okay, hold on. I had a couple of other, well, I, I want to switch gears for just a second because I'm curious, you mentioned that you're, you know, giving another um, talk about the book to another group, but you know, in all of the work that you, um, that you do, and, you know, now you've, you've made this incredible product and here we are meeting virtually, right? And it's just not necessarily what any of us would have ever, you know, planned. And I'm just curious from your standpoint, as we think about say the museum or other arts organizations, what are you seeing that's innovative? Like what's getting you excited about what people um, are trying to do right now to, to try to you know, continue the arts and continue programming? You know, um, I'm not sure I have the full picture of that, but I can tell you that um, that ArtsWave has actually been doing a lot of work to collect information to mm -hmm. answer that very question. I mean, they're kind of monitoring it. And I have a couple of things that, I, that I've that i seen and I know about, but they're really trying to figure out, are there any gems in there that, you know, this one's figured out that can be shared with others. Um, so Playhouse in the Park, for example, um, is something that I really enjoy a lot personally. So they have actually, to the extent that they have videos of their performances, they're showing those on their, well, it's not on their website. I actually get notified of that in an email. So every week, just so they stay connected with people who are subscribers, because we cannot go there and it's devastating. Yeah. Um, they give an update on what they're doing. They're actually in the middle of a capital campaign to you know, build a new building. I mean, it just, it's the worst of all possible times for arts organizations. And so um, anything that they can do to keep themselves in front of you and engage you in a fun way, which there aren't many options. Um, I just encourage you to be as supportive as you can, both financially, and then just to pay attention to what comes your way in your inbox or um, over the internet. But you might ask someone from ArtsWave to actually do a presentation for you so they could talk a little bit more in depth and more broadly about what's happening um, in our arts community. Yeah, that sounds like a great, that sounds like a great idea. And I think I have a feeling there's a couple of people from ArtsWave on uh, in our audience today. So we'll have to get in touch with them. I know they've but, been very supportive of, um, of the museum in this time, that's for sure. Um, okay, so back to some questions about the um, amazing uh, artists and ladies that you have highlighted for us tonight. We have another question from Andrew and he was wondering, um, was Baker Hunt considered a progressive for the work that she did in, you know, with, the, uh, with the museum and her cultural center? I don't know how to answer this. I think there may have been equal numbers of people who thought she was weird because of her little psychic religion bent as who thought she was progressive. Uh, so I'm not sure how that actually shook out. Um, I certainly think she was progressive in starting that foundation mm -hmm. so early on. I mean, people hardly even knew the name foundation, the Carnegie Foundation, the Ford Foundation, all the big ones that you know today, they didn't exist in 1922. So there were other nonprofit organizations, but they didn't use the word foundation. So in that regard, and she, I, I forget this part of the story. I didn't write it in the profile. She had a cousin in New England somewhere, which is where her family came from originally, who got onto the idea of a house museum, like using your home mm. as a museum. And so she copied her cousin on that. So that was unique in our region. There was no one else who was doing that. Um, the Taft Museum of Art, the Tafts were still living in that house at the time. So it didn't become, uh, so Artsway was founded in 1927. I hope I'm right about that. I'm close to right about that, if not on 100%. But the Taft Museum of Art um, did not become so until after you know, the Tafts were done living there. So yeah, I think from that standpoint, she was progressive, but thought to be a bit odd. That's fair. 
fair. Well, thank you for, for diving into her story just, um, just a little bit more. And, um, and, and all of these have been, have been just absolutely incredible. I'm going to look really quickly and make sure that we didn't miss anything from our Facebook audience. Um, we are streaming this live to Facebook, which is great because then it's just captured and you guys can uh, log in anytime you like and watch these. So uh, we have set, wow. Okay, actually quite a few people watching right now. So, and that have been. So thank you to all of you. Now, Kathy, we had talked about maybe doing a quiz yes. and it occurs to me that we have not done it yet. So right. I think that, um, you know, the, the audience I think is ready. So if you don't mind sharing the question and then I'll watch the chat and we'll see if anybody can get the right answer. How does that sound? All righty. And no cheating with Mr. Google. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Right. <laughs> All right. So here's the question. What is the name of the 1951 song that propelled Rosemary Clooney to fame? Great. I feel like we should have somebody who knows the answer to this one. Oh my goodness. Okay. Let's see. We've got two different answers so far. Joe is correct. Okay, it looks like, oh, now there's more. Actually, looks like Luann beat Joe with oh, the same okay. answer like seconds before. I so. don't see Luann on my screen. <laughs> I don't have to monitor that. Oh, she sent it privately just to me. That's why I oh, see. Okay. So, um, well, I tell you what, since we have a tie, to, I feel like that's a tie. So, Luann. Um, I'm just going to write your name down here, Luann Holmes and Joe Daughtery. Congrats. You guys are the uh, official winners of the quiz tonight. And I'm a little behind. Sorry, everybody, for mailing out the buttons. But um, I, will, uh, I will try to get those to you guys as soon as I can. Um, your addresses should be um, in the registration. But if for some reason, um, they aren't in that. And we'll, we'll get in touch with you guys. We have your email addresses. So, um, well, that was a really good one. So for those of you that are not reading the chat, um, Kathy, why don't you tell them, uh, the, the name of the song? Cause I'm not sure we actually said it out loud. Oh, um, it is, I w I'm not going to sing it for you though. Come on to my house. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Perfect. Um, you can sing if you like, no, I mean, I can't, I sing. will not be not going <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. I, yeah, well, I'm definitely not going to be singing. Um, well, so here's my question for you, uh, as we're closing out is what's your next project? I'm actually already at work on a second book and this one also about a woman is a fluke that it's about a woman and it's very different. I'm writing a biography of Katherine Hilker who um, is world famous for the uh, innovation of cat ambassador programs at our Cincinnati Zoo and for cheetah conservation around the world. Um, she is one of three women noted for their work to conserve the cheetah in Africa. The other two being uh, Dr. Lori Marker from the Cheetah um, foundation and a woman from South Africa uh, who runs Cheetah Outreach, I think is the name of it. But uh, she's equally famous because she was offered the job that Jane Goodall took because Catherine declined it, which is just a fascinating story. There's an author whose name is Dale Peterson who has written a biography of Jane Goodall and he actually shares that entire story in his book about Jane. And with his permission, I'm using that story in the biography. Uh, so it's very different. It's um, Catherine's 89, she'll be 90 next June 22nd, and this book will be delivered for her birthday. Wow, that yeah. is phenomenal. I actually, I'm pretty sure I heard her speak once at the zoo at a, at a presentation and what a, a wonderful story to capture in a book that is, that She's is dynamic. Fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, um, I am so grateful that you joined us tonight. Mm -hmm. I am very, very thankful for, for your um, participation and, and just for your, um, 
I don't know, spirit to have uh, just a very fun conversation about some really am amazing women in our community. And, um, and thank you for tying them to Behringer Cropper Museum. We really appreciate that. Absolutely. Very much so. Um, I do want to say a couple of things before we let everyone go. Um, but um, again, thank you to our supporters and our members. Thanks to the whole museum staff for, for making this happen. And I do wanna also let everybody know what we're doing next week. So we have a little bit of a different um, format for next week. So we are going to be partnering with the Northern Kentucky Forum. And the Northern Kentucky Forum is a partnership of the uh, Northern Kentucky University Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement uh, led by Mark Nykirk. And I saw him on here earlier. I'm not sure if he's still with us. Uh, but Mark is, um, has been leading the forum for many years now, and um, he has partnered with all the local libraries. And so they do a series of events on, you know, current events and different things. But the next conversation will be next Wednesday. And to all of our regular participants, we'll get out the link to you all. Um, but I will not be your host. Uh, you will be um, entertained and educated about the creation of racial constructs. So basically the, um, the, let me see, let me pull this up again. It's called Mourning the Creation of Racial Categories. So it's all about um, basically exactly what it sounds like. So the idea of race being something that, you know, has been invented really and, and how it's happened. And I think there's some ties to Northern Kentucky in there, but really kind of a global issue. So um, we uh, hope you enjoy that presentation and we will be back with you the following week for an interesting topic about Northern Kentucky history. And uh, we'll get all the info to you all soon. So in the meantime, Kathy, good luck on your next book. Can't Thank wait you. to read it. And to all of you, I hope you have a great night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Take care.